Welcome back to Gaudi Video Podcast. This is a space where we host conversations with different architects, designers, and industry thought leaders to help educate you and your work. My name is Joe Agati, and I'm the CEO and Director of Design here at Agati Furniture. Today, we have Carla Trout, the Executive Director of Lancaster County Library System in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Carla, I'm excited to hear about your perspective on the library world of today and moving forward. So great to have you here today. Welcome. Thanks, Joe. It's great to be with you. How are things going down in PA? They're going. Um, we're in various stages of reopening and reconnecting to the public and in interesting and new ways um, and, and in old ways, too. Lancaster County has more than 500,000 people, so we we got a, okay. the county got a fair amount of CARES Act money oh, and great. they were they were plugged in to what's going on with the libraries and so we we were a recipient of about 1.2 million dollars oh wow in cares act money so that helped enable us to prepare the buildings but also mm -hmm. to just keep things afloat to not have that stress has allowed us to focus on some of the other more creative ways of reconnecting with people yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, well, I definitely want to dig into obviously your perspective of today and the future. But before we go too far, I wanted to get a little background on you and your sure. journey and how you came to be into the library world. Well, you know, it's funny. I was just thinking about that the other day. I'm approaching 20 years. Oh, wow. I congratulations. Think of myself like, holy cow, I just started this library thing, <laughs> but it, it'll be 20 years in October. What I always like to joke that I tripped, stumbled and fell into librarianship. I was a business person, um, grew up in, in an entrepreneurial family. My dad um, and mom owned and ran a lumber mill and um, Trout Lumber Company when I was a kid. And also when I was... Um, 11 or 12, my dad started a, a furniture company. It was actually outdoor patio furniture. From the time I was really young, my mm. mom was the bookkeeper and did all of that. She taught me how to do the payroll mm. when I was about eight. So um, <laughs> I, That's I impressive. had math aptitude even at that age, <laughs> but I didn't grow up around books. My, my family, my parents were, were doers. They weren't readers. And so I went to first grade as a remedial reader having never been read to a single time in my whole life and, you know, grew up not really a reader myself until I um, was in grad school working on oh, wow. my library degree and <laughs> kind of got pushed into reading a lot of young adult books for a class and <laughs> just totally fell in love with reading for pleasure. And um, I'm still much more oriented towards nonfiction and information than I am towards reading for pleasure because I have a hard time pressing pause long enough to sit still to read a book. Um, I think it's why I like audiobooks so much because I can do and hear at the same time. And I and I always joke I'm making up for all those years of not having been read to. <laughs> but um, I was doing some consulting work and ended up having someone suggest to me um, you should go talk to the folks at the library. They've had had some challenges and they could really use your help. And I ended up talking with them and they didn't want a consultant. And, and then in the process of all of that, 9-11 happened and they called me back and said, we can't stop thinking about you. And I was working a fair distance from home and it was an opportunity to give back and, you know, all the things mm -hmm. we thought about after 9-11. And mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, I can do this for a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 20 years later, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> I ended up through that process of it, working as a library director, was hired as the library director without a single day of experience, um, going back, getting a master's degree. And one of the major things that just bringing that library into the current age, mm. um, electronically, mm. business-wise, and being able to watch them evolve and grow to the point of a new building project and seeing that succeed and really building a new connection, a connection with the community where the library served as the center, the hub. Um, and then once I, you know, it accomplished a lot of things there, you know, move on up from library director to library system administrator. Uh, I was in Adams County in, Evans, in Gettysburg for a little while. 
Um, and then two years ago, I made the leap to Lancaster County. They wooed me away and said, come be with us in, in you know, in Pennsylvania Dutch territory. And it's been a really great transition. I actually don't work in a library building anymore. Um, I work in an office. Our office is um, about 20 employees. And we, I always say we're an umbrella, but mm-hmm. not not an umbrella over, an umbrella under. We undergird our libraries. We provide them with the tools and the the support that they need to serve the community. So I do love books, but I'm the one, I'm the little girl who never played library growing up. All of my <laughs> colleagues did. And I'm like, what? You did that? No, I know, don't know about that. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. I've never heard of playing library. Yeah, I was like, I was at my first library conference and they were giving out like the Lifetime Achievement Award and they asked how many people played library as a child. And I think (laughs) I was the only person who didn't (laughs) raise my hand because that was a foreign concept to me. I was afraid of the library growing up. Um, My family, my mom never had a library card. Even after I was a librarian, I was like, mom, you need a library card. No, she was intimidated and I was too. So I bring that perspective of why People, because libraries are wonderful places and the people who work in them are the most engaging, intelligent, but yet kind and connecting people that there are. Um, there's nothing to fear, but there's this perception that it's complicated and people don't know. And, and you know, we're a very independent nation in particular. And so we're not good at asking for help. And so we come into something we don't quite understand and we don't want to ask anybody for help. So, you know, I would encourage people, don't be afraid. But yeah. I also, when I approach librarianship, I do it from the perspective of some people are, and we can't assume that they aren't and that everyone has had that growing up library experience, which so many of us did and some of us didn't. So yeah. um, it's a different perspective, but I think a good one at the table. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting because you talk about help. And I think a lot of people, you know, obviously um, our business has been, has been involved in the library um, uh, industry since I was a, a small child. And I think a lot of people don't understand the help aspect that the library offers. I think a lot of people that, you know, view the library, it's like, oh, it's just the place that has the books. Mm-hmm. But it's really, you know, you know, if you really kind of think of like the evolution of the library, yeah, I guess it was a book repository at one point, but it's, it's really not the case, especially in the more modern age. But, you know, I think back to when you're saying about intimidating the library, I think back to my early library experiences. So I'm dyslexic. So I was and my dad's dyslexic too. So I always joke, I'm like, who, who thought two dyslexic people <laughs> would have a business that provides uh, furniture to the library uh, world? Um, you know, he's a, he's a big reader now, but I remember younger, um, you know, I, we grow, I grew up in Chicago here and my local-ish library was the Harold Washington Library downtown. And so I had, uh, I did an independent study in uh, eighth grade and I needed to do research at the library and it was intimidating. You know, it's a beautiful building, but it's really big. I'm like, I don't know where to go, but they, the librarians are were really helpful. And I like every like Friday afternoon for like a month, they were helping me go through old popular mechanics magazines um, on the microfilm and microfiche because I was trying to find blueprints uh, from an article. So I, I was trying to build a, uh, an old-fashioned hang glider mm-hmm. from a 1909 article that was published in Popular Mechanics. But I only had the one page. I needed page number two. Oh, and so wow. they're just tremendously helpful. And I think people don't realize like the help, you know, on a small scale like that, but it, like the help it provides to an entire community. Mm-hmm. You know, in this world, people say, um, you know, why do we still need libraries? Can't you get everything online? And and that's part of the problem is now, it, years past, it was you went to the library to get the information because the library was the repository for the information. Today, you can get the information anywhere. You go to the library for the expertise of the people who know how to vet it. Yes. So that you can get something that's true. 
That's mm-hmm. factual. That's that source document. Go back to the the popular mechanics, so you can actually get to the article, not yeah. just well, Joe Schmo over here built one of these hand gliders, and you can watch his video. <laughs> well, no, but yeah. I want the actual blueprint so I can build yeah. it the way it originally was, not with Joe Schmo's opinion inserted in it. Exactly, and that's what we do, and it's what we're. You know, I was just talking to one of my county commissioners yesterday, and I said to him, you know. Our professionalism as libraries is the most valuable thing we bring to our communities. Our ability to connect people with that opportunity that will transform their life forever um, in a way that no one else can. And it's it's what we learn, it's what we live on a day-to-day basis. And that, what I like to call um, affinity connection, that personal Mm -hmm. connection i think is it's one of the things that that we're working back towards through this Mm -hmm. pandemic and that we've had to sort of weave new pathways towards as we as our buildings have been closed people love to come and connect one-on-one at the library and you know the buildings have been challenged by that and people are afraid to be close you know the distance is a is a challenge but libraries have really risen to the occasion of how to continue to provide programming. And I know a lot of people are struggling with online Zoom fatigue and things like that. But, yes. Um, yes. but just the innovation that I'm seeing come out of our libraries and how they're still connecting with the community and how they're building new connections and how some of those new things and things that have been necessitated out of this time will will go forward and they will last um just a remarkable community of people that um i'm really proud to be part of so being the director over the last year how tell us how it's gone what's going on (laughs) oh wow it's (laughs) It's a lot to unpack in that question i know (laughs) well here in pennsylvania of course about March 16th of last year, we got the order, you will close your building. Mm. Um, and not only will you get the order, you will close your building, but you will not go into it. You oh, will wow. not enter your building. And so in my office, we jumped in and said, okay, we need to take our summer and make it happen for the community somehow remotely. And we did everything from standing up software for online registration and tracking of summer reading to Um, moving all of the countywide planned programs onto Zoom and other online platforms and, you know, facilitated those for the libraries and just really didn't stop. We, we, we didn't miss a beat. We, we continued on and, and just said, how, how can we support you through this? And, and then as things reopened you know when when we were approaching june and things were starting to get better and our buildings were going to open helping the libraries innovate ways that they could be open you know have barriers in place Mm -hmm. utilize spaces differently in an effort to um, serve the community i was amazed at how quickly and easily we moved from an office full of people who were side by side every day to being disparately spread around dealing with family situations and different levels of technology and how well we all just transformed into this different same group of people with a different mission for for a time and and moved things forward to to make sure that the people in our county continue to have access to library services it's very impressive to see how you know kind of you were thrown like a lot of people just kind of thrown in the middle of something and, you know, how well you guys are able to kind of get together, navigate, you know, kind of still, you know, provide um, for the people kind of in your community. That's very impressive. So let me ask you, like, I guess over the last year, what do you think has been the biggest struggle for, for uh, public libraries overall? There have been a couple of things. One, of course, the uncertainty of what this virus was and, you know, Could you catch it from somebody having borrowed one of our books? You know, we went from Mm -hmm. quarantining materials for, you know, almost two weeks down to, I think we're down to 48 hours and I expect Mm -hmm. that'll go away altogether pretty soon. Yeah. You know, so a lot of uncertainty about that. A lot of 
exposures and quarantines and sick people and, you know, dealing with that. Um, so that's, that's been a challenge, you know, change is stressful, even when it's positive positive. Sure. Um, and having to just shift to the way of thinking and the way of providing service has, has been fatiguing and collectively the library community needs a big vacation. <laughs> so. Sure. So how do you think the, like, you know, again, the events, the most recent events, the pandemic, you know, how do you think that's going to uh, obviously impact the library going forward? I guess both like, you know, there's probably going to be some negative impacts, but also I think there's probably going to be some positive benefits coming out of coming out of this too. Yeah. I think libraries um, are, we're such a part of the fabric of the community mm-hmm. and it's obvious I, I, use is not, is, has not come back to normal levels anywhere near in, in our libraries. And I think in general in libraries um, and part of that is people want the human connection and right now they can't have it so easily with the warmer weather, we're going to see a lot more things move outside again. And I think that that's going to be something that persists. Um, I think I think utilizing outdoor spaces in ways that we haven't thought about in the past is something that's going to continue on. I also think that we're going to start thinking about fresh air incursion mm-hmm. into space. Yeah. That, particularly in Pennsylvania, because our summers tend to be humid and our winters tend to be cold. And we have these, you know, two weeks in the spring and two in the fall where it's perfect weather to open the windows. We tend to not build fresh air into yep. our spaces. And I I think that that may change, that mm-hmm. we may find more fresh air being thought about, um, mm-hmm. you know, and building spaces that can be opened to the air so yeah. that people can be inside and yet outside, you know, Um, So I I think that that kind of thing, as we think about reimagining what libraries are going to be like in the bigger picture, in the smaller picture, I think it's going to be how can we be together and yet have that sense of togetherness and yet keep some level of separation when necessary. A lot of libraries have a lot of manipulatives and toys and things for kids. Mm -hmm. How do we continue to offer those things and do them in a sanitary, safe kind of a way that we yeah. haven't maybe thought about before and how we do programs, I, you know, how we can create spaces that are flexible enough to give people room to be together and, and yet stretch out. I was just saying, one of our earlier podcasts, I was talking with uh, an architect that uh, works on uh, uh, airports and we do quite a bit of airport work and, you know, it kind of came up about space and separation, you know, we, we get asked a lot, like, how are we designing our product differently to accommodate a COVID era? And, you know, I, I kind of look at it and it's like, well, we're really not doing anything different. We may be extending some panels a little higher or maybe putting on some extra panels or temporary panels. But what I've noticed is that we've been forcing people into tighter and tighter spaces and they don't really feel that comfortable in them, but they would just been accepting it. And now I think one of the positive things coming out of this is people's understanding of, you know, the space people need to feel comfortable. And that, you know, it doesn't have to be six feet between people, but, you know, there is that, you know, we talk about it in a personal bubble. You know, we want people to come back and yep. feel welcome and feel safe. Mm-hmm. And so we have to design it that way. And librarians are people who, I have seen that give of themselves freely far more than most any profession. Um, you know, I always joke that they can squeeze more money out of a nickel than anybody. They've gone above and beyond and out of their comfort zones to be on camera. Um, you know, when they're really comfortable being in front of a bunch of little kids yeah. and to have to then get themselves on camera and know that the whole world's watching potentially. Um, You know, we had a a video here and one of the library directors here read um, a Pennsylvania Dutch Christmas, Twas the Night Before Christmas in the Pennsylvania Dutch version and it went viral. And there were, she had, I think between 50 and 100,000 views. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's great. Book. And she's not even the story time lady. <laughs> she's just the person who was in the, in the library who had 
Pennsylvania Dutch heritage so she could put the right spin on the accent. Okay. And, it, and she was like, oh my gosh. And you could just see how embarrassed she was. Mm-hmm. Her cheeks were rosy and <laughs> but she stepped up and, you know, what a great attention getter for her mm-hmm. library for something like that to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, not that that book necessarily changed anybody's life, but her library is on a map. Yeah. Uh, and people in the community who may yeah. not have known how fun and friendly the local library was, um, got a viewpoint of their library director and they got to laugh alongside her. And now, you know, they're going to be wanting to connect. I, I guarantee it, it brought people there. So, yeah. That sounds so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So early in our conversation, you talked about, you know, kind of being an advocate for the libraries and, you know, I think one of the fun things about working kind of in the library community is there's, there's never a lack of passion Mm, with everybody. It seems like everybody that works at the library is very passionate about what they do. But I guess, how could you, do you have any suggestions or recommendations on advocacy? Because it's important, you know, like we've talked about is that I think people don't always understand the the impact and the full value of the library to the community. Is there a recommendation you can give to all the librarians or directors about being that kind of strong advocate? Advocacy is something I'm very passionate about. Um, probably more so than most of the people I know. Um, And it's the people who come into our libraries love us. And Mm -hmm. if you ask anyone, they will tell you they love the library, but (laughs) that doesn't always translate to funding. um, And it doesn't always translate to local government support or even higher levels of government support. Um, And I think the thing that, that I would say is tell your story, tell it, too often, to tell it often, tell it to anyone who will listen and get other people to tell it for you as well. Um, if you're not comfortable going and talking to your elect- elected officials, find somebody who is, you know, um, chances are there's someone on your board who is, and maybe that person isn't comfortable with telling your story, but maybe they're comfortable with making the connection. You know, I am I am a gregarious person and you would never guess that I am shy, but I am. And something <laughs> I would I've never learned, guess that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Um, but something that I've learned is that I do really well if somebody makes an introduction for me. And okay. so um, when I'm needing to go meet with new people in a situation, like if I'm working a fundraiser mm-hmm. for the library, I will take one of my board members who's really good at connecting people Mm. And I will ask that person to be my wing man or woman. And, and, you know, if I see somebody who I don't really know, I'll ask them, do you know this person? Can you connect me with them? Can you, can let's walk over there and, and you can introduce yourself and then make the introduction of me. Mm-hmm. And there's something about that. Once that ice is broken and the introduction mm. is made, I have no problem telling this story, but I have a hard time doing the cold call and walking up to somebody. And I think that that's true of a lot of my colleagues as well. The best way to build relationships, particularly with elected officials, Mm -hmm. is to go where they are, not to their meetings, but find out what community events they attend, Mm -hmm. um, what chamber mixers they go to, things like that, and show up at those. And then get somebody who knows them to introduce you. Yeah. And, And do your research. Find out what committees they serve on. Find out what they're passionate about. Learn something about that and then start an intelligent conversation about a topic that is of interest to them, not about the library. Yeah. And pretty soon they're going, so what is it that you do? (laughs) You know, I stopped telling people that I work at the library. Um, They'll say to me, what do you do? And I'll say, I connect people to opportunities that enrich their lives. And almost always they'll go, how do you do that? (laughs) And I have, you know, several little catchphrases to go from there. And by the time they're hooked in Mm -hmm. to the conversation and want to know more about me and what I do, that's when they find out that I work at the library. And they have long forgotten because if if someone says to me, what do I do? And I say, oh, I'm a librarian. They have a stereotype in their mind. And that's what they don't need to know anything else because they know what that is in their Mm -hmm. thinking. Um, but when you tell them something completely different, yeah. like you connect people to opportunity. Isn't that exciting? That's exciting. You want to know. <laughs> it sounds exciting. Um, and what you once you've opened the door and they think you're exciting and engaging, then they forget that 
you know, then they go, you're a librarian? <laughs> it can't be. <laughs> but it is, really, it is. That's, that's really great advice. Um, thank you for sharing that. I want to just turn our conversation back towards facilities. Um, you opened and you're, oh, and you're working on a new library uh, in the system right now. I wanted to get yeah. just a kind of background and perspective of that, especially opening and building a new library in kind of the pandemic age. Yeah, we had a library that opened in July of 2020. They were had broken ground and the construction vehicles were all there and everything was happening. Um, and the pandemic struck and, and in Pennsylvania, construction was shut down completely um, for, for several months. And so the project was, I mean, literally they walked away from the project and they, they came back, I think the next day and moved away some equipment, but most of the equipment just sat there for months. I knew so, so so the project was on hold for a while. Um, thankfully they got it back and and because some construction didn't restart, they actually had extra resources, so they sort of caught up with what was behind. Okay. Um I, I said one of the serendipitous things that happened with that library was that they they didn't really have budget for mm-hmm. some of the interiors, you know, the the furnishings in particular. And so the library director who's brand new, she's newer than me. Um, she comes in and she's, she calls me and she's like, I have no budget. And I'm like, what? And so, you know, I was helping her. We sourced a few things, but for the most part, because of the pandemic, people couldn't come in the library and sit down. They didn't need tables and chairs. They didn't, some of the things that they would have ordinarily had to have on opening day, they didn't have to have. And, they opened a beautiful new building. Uh, we were able to source enough shelving and get that all in place. And when people came in and saw how nice the place was and how much it w- they wanted to be there, mm-hmm. funding actually came in to support the purchase of the, the furnishings mm-hmm. that they needed. So uh, the library is now open completely and and is furnished. And um, But they, they were in the process of purchasing some things um, the pandemic definitely had an impact on the types of computer stations that they got, ones that were round with partitions in between instead of long side by side with no division, um, some things like that 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 they rethought um, as a result of, you know, safety and, and considerations going forward. Um, and then we have, a, we have our flagship library, our largest library in the county is um, in the midst of a project. It's also dealt with a lot of construction delays. Um, and it's a joint project that's being attached to a hotel. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, it, it's a kind of an interesting combination. Mm-hmm. The, the hotel wanted to build a parking deck to attach to it. Mm-hmm. And I think that that they realized that selling a parking deck to the city wasn't going to be so attractive. Mm-hmm. They also, the parking deck was going to sit behind a park, a city park. And they, so they were like, well, how can we better connect the community with mm-hmm. this, and this park with this parking deck? And, and one of them had the brilliant idea of, well, hmm. you know, our library needs to be updated or replaced, really replaced. Mm-hmm. Um, and, if we build the library on the front end that jets into this park, the library can utilize the parking deck. It makes it more attractive to the city, you know, it, and, and the community will have a different connection with the park and will want to use the parking deck for the library. And I'm sure that we'll be helping them reimagine some of the space as we go forward. Cause that's, yeah. um, that's not really been done at this point. And, and, um, in light of COVID, it's going to need, it's going to need mm-hmm. a second look. So, yeah. I mean, that's a, such an interesting project, library connected to the hotel. It's very, I, I, it's, I, it's very nice to hear kind of like, kind of what a collaborative effort to kind of think about hotel, parking deck, park, and, you know, how does, yeah. how can the library fit in that? Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I got to applaud the guy who is the owner of this hotel. He is mm-hmm. his, his innovative thinking. Yeah. That, ultimately really benefits the community in a way Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't expect is um, it's admirable. He's, he's smart. He's very smart. Um, I've gotten the opportunity to meet him a couple of times and it's it's fun to work with somebody who has that kind of 
thought process. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. And you talked about kind of the challenges of the libraries in your community and how they serve kind of different makeups in the day, you know, it's seniors at one point and then it's the adolescents at one at another point. And then there's the overlapping and the space needs to kind of, you know, you talked about flexibility, flexibility a number of times, you know, something I've seen with the pandemic going on is that when there's been these trends and I've heard about flexibility a lot in the spaces, you know, the pandemic has just accelerated a lot of them. Would oh, you yeah. kind of feel that that's, you know, you're dealing with a flexibility challenge, but is that one, one that's really been accelerated with everything going on and what you're seeing? Yeah, I think flexibility and adaptability are mm-hmm. paramount mm-hmm. more so than they ever have been. Mm-hmm. I've always preached that. Um, yeah. I, you know, whenever I've worked with libraries, they're like, well, we're building these spaces. And I'm like, no, why don't you knock this wall down and make this something that can be moved and changed? And, yeah. and now they're all going, so how can we knock our walls down and make them so they can be <laughs> moved and changed? Um, because we have learned that, you know, I, I, I've come to loathe the word pivot <laughs> because everybody uses it constantly. I've tried really hard today to not say pivot, um, but um, we have had to shift away from the the traditional way of doing things. And I mean, I was thinking today about building outdoor spaces and then putting folding glass walls in between them. So on a beautiful day like today, where it's it's 72 degrees in April, we could fold out the walls and have fresh air incursion and people feel comfortable sitting in a space where there's a whole lot of fresh air. I think that that flexibility and adaptability inside and connecting inside to outside and with furnishings, being able to reconfigure furnishings so that they can be closer or further apart so that yep. they can be, you know, I love some of the things that you're working on right now with your different pods and especially all the different curved lines, because yeah. you can have people really fairly close to each other and mm-hmm. yet there's enough separation. But, you know, even in libraries that don't have budgets for all new furnishings, um, you can be pretty creative just by tearing down some of your shelving and rearranging it and moving, moving, it from being rows and rows and rows and rows of shelving in a row to breaking it up some and putting some tables in between mm-hmm. where you have yeah. these partitions created out of shelving that allow people to sit at a table a couple at a time and not be breathing next to the people because books make great barriers. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, they're also very That's sound true. deadening. Um, but you know, being creative with space and, and having it moved and all the better if you, those shelves are on wheels and you can roll them around and reconfigure them to meet the needs as, as things transform. But yeah, flexibility and adaptability. I mean, I, I'm an advocate of it to an extreme where you put in raised concrete floors and you can move everything from the electrical outlets to the vent plugs to everything. I mean, that would be my dream in building a building and a lot of places that's standard now, you know, but there are ways to be flexible and adaptable, even if you can't tear down your walls. Um, And I also think that our embracing of some, some forms of technology that we haven't before and making our spaces more technologically connected, I think we're always going to have demand for in-person and Zoom story time. I think, you know, that there are going to be some families whose little kid doesn't feel good that day, who are now accustomed to being able to just go on and participate in the, the program remotely or mm-hmm. still going to want that. And we're going to start wiring our spaces to better accommodate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Interesting. Well, I really appreciate the time today. This is a, this is a great conversation. Um, I guess just before we go, I wanted to see, I know you gave a lot of really good advice um, to our folks out there, but I want to see if you wanted to leave any kind of last bit advice to, to the people in the library community. I would say just give yourself grace. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, compassion, we talk a lot about compassion for other people, but have compassion on yourself. You know, you've done an admirable job in this, in this season and even before this season and um, give yourself grace and compassion. And from me to, to the library community as a whole, you know, here is my standing (laughs) ovation to all of you um, <laughs> on the work that you're doing. And um, it's, it is changing people's lives. Yeah, um, absolutely. Please, please remember that, that you, the little things that you do that are just feel like every day to you are transformational to, to a child or an adult or 
someone who steps in your door. So give yourself a standing ovation, accept one from me and, and give yourself grace and, mm-hmm. and take care of yourself because you can't save the world if you yeah. can't, if you don't save yourself first. Yeah. Good advice. Well, again, I really appreciate the time today. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Anytime. Anytime.